Yay. So we're rolling. We're rolling. And uh, so, yeah, why don't we kick it off with maybe talking about what you've been up to lately, how your, your students are going, how your lessons are going, what kind of music you've been working on, projects. Yeah. Um, I have been writing some new music. Um, I'm trying to get into more into like electronic music. So with, I have a synthesizer, a mini Korg, a uh, mini log Korg, and I'm trying to get into, um, using that and my Nord and the piano, all of them together. Um, and today I was working on it and I think my next move is a loop pedal. So I've been trying to get into that. And then I've also just been going back and shedding a bunch of Charlie Parker Omnibook songs, actually. And I've been working on some Chopin. Ooh. So kind of across the, across the board, just it's... I'm practicing for something specific, like learning the music for a specific person's show or my own music or I'm writing for a specific purpose but now there's no purpose other than just goals that I have and things I want to learn so every day I can kind of look at it and be like oh I I want to learn this I want to dig deeper into that and uh that's really fun I don't get to do that often great yeah how about you yeah, so I've, um, I'm excited to get out um, to release my latest single, What Will Our Children Say, which is kind of a um, kind of a motivational song about kind of the children of the future and what kind of world will be they'll be living in in the next 10 to 20, 30 years. So um, my friend from L.A. did the artwork, it's like hand dip painted an oil drawing for the cover art. And yeah, it's kind of like a musical theatery song. It's more in like a singer songwriter vein, okay. but excited to to release it. And then also kind of just disappointed and you're in the same boat. I know we were talking earlier about um, kind of our albums being on hold a little bit. Yeah. I but, know. Uh, hey, it's more time to kind of shed more time to, you know, perfect them and get them studio ready. Yeah, definitely. And I feel like people will be so um, eager to hear live music and to check out and support new projects when this is all over because I think it, this quarantine makes people appreciate art more, yes. you know, because what else do you have? You don't have much being in your house. Um, you can cook, you can exercise, you can watch TV, and you can, like, consume art in some capacity, you know. You can read, but, you, you know, there's you can listen to more music. You can um, live stream more shows. You can, you know, get into some uh, deeper connection with art I think very true very true yeah it's a kind of an introspective time for a lot of us introverts yeah <laughs> kind of, definitely yeah a time to kind of practice and to kind of it took me a while I don't know about you Kaylee but right when it hit it's like I went through this freeze where I wasn't composing or playing for like a good couple weeks I was just like in shot and then it finally my voice started coming back out again and my ideas that it took a while and now it's just like flooding <laughs> yeah definitely I think I mean, I had a similar experience. I actually got very sick. Um, I think I had the coronavirus, but um, I that kind of came at the beginning of when we were quarantined. And also, I think leading up to the um, quarantine, there's the regular life. I live in New York City, and the pace of life here is so fast. You just run around every day usually, and one thing to the next, and every day was full. So when it first hit, I was like, oh, sigh of relief, like, wow, a minute to just, you know, have time to think or rest or whatever it was. But then slight, shortly after that, I got very sick. And then after that, the past two weeks, I've been finding the groove of like, what does every day look like? And what are some goals that I want um, to achieve? I've been working on some grant applications. And um, yeah, and then trying to pace out the day with some create creative work yeah it's also give a good balance going on that that's great I, that's what I'm striving for a little bit but it's it's challenging you have to be really disciplined <laughs> it is yeah it's hard to structure your but I feel like if anyone's kind of good at that it's artists and independent you know self-employed people because I don't know about you but I'm sure your days all look different and yeah, yeah. you have a lot of free time at home where you have a lot to do but you kind of need to decide what's important 
So I think we're kind of pros at learning how to, you know, find things to do. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I guess if you put it that way, I guess we are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So tell me a little bit about, um, and I don't think I really gave you a proper introduction, but we met um, back when you came to Michigan, and I think, it, were you doing a master class near the University of Michigan, or was it at Michigan? Um, we were staying in Ann Arbor, Michigan, but we were actually playing at Cliff Bells in Detroit. So we weren't doing a master class in um, Michigan, actually, but we were staying there, and we were kind of commuting back and forth. I'm trying to remember, and right around that time, I think I just was searching like women in jazz, other jazz pianists, you know, and I came across um, Ariel Pocock and yourself right around the same time. And I remember just like reaching out to you and being like, hey, you know, <laughs> let's connect. And you were so sweet. And I remember you made a special trip to um, University of Michigan School of Music. And I remember we just like sat down in a practice room and just shed. It was so fun. Yeah, yeah that was so fun. <laughs> I had never been to University of Michigan and I had always heard about it and Jerry Allen. And I've always wanted to check out um, the legacy there. I, I just know it's such a breeding ground and has such a great history so it was a treat for me to get to um go and you showed me around and we got to be in one of those practice rooms and it was really fun to play yeah I wonder if um I don't think Benny Green was teaching I think it might have still been Jerry when you came right I think it was slightly after Jerry Allen I think yeah I think it was Benny Green it was in 2016 um oh, okay I don't know if that was around the time of her passing or before, but yeah. I, uh, Slightly I, after she passed away, but okay. I should double check that. No, I was grateful to have a chance to, to study with her. And then it was, you know, very hard for everyone when she passed. But then Benny Green came and it kind of was like, oh my gosh, like, <laughs> thank yeah. you. We, we needed another really great, it was some large footsteps to fill. So he yeah. um, came and it was just Wonderful. But I mean, talking of great mentors, I think you can really speak to working with a, a jazz giant and, and a uh, great and educator, Danilo Perez. I don't know if you want to share a little bit about your, your uh, mentee experience with him. Yeah, I went to Berkeley College of Music for my undergrad in Boston, and Danilo has a program there called the Berkeley Global Jazz Institute, and it's a program uh, that emphasizes music as a vehicle for social change and using music in um, different environments to uh, give peace and positive uh, positive light basically so we would play in prisons and children's hospitals and um and retirement centers and and the music we would do all these different classes having to do with um visual art and and sound music and um yeah it was really cool he was such an incredible mentor to me and i uh i miss him very much um, I live in New York now and he lives in Boston, but every time he comes to New York, I, I see him and trying to get to Boston more to uh, see him again. But Benny Green is actually someone that I also studied with on the West Coast at camps, not regularly. I'm from Portland, Oregon, and he um, was always a huge part of the West Coast jazz scene. So he was always at the camps that I was going to growing up and all the festivals that I went to growing up, he was always playing and he was a huge, um, huge uh, influence of mine, just someone that I admired and, and he's has such a bright and happy energy too. He's a great, yeah, great musician. Very true, very true. What were some of the festivals you've been in most recently? Most recently, wow. I haven't been to a festival that recently I think but let's see over the summer I was at um, the Stanford Jazz Festival I've been teaching at the camp Stanford Jazz Workshop um, for many years and before that I was at some different festivals in New York um, like Winter Jazz Fest and stuff like that um, there was most recently I think the um, Chamber Music America had a, a fest conference festival in New York and I was at that I played with a group um, but I haven't been to a festival in a while like the Dominican Republic Jazz Festival I played at and that was one where it was out of town and flew out. But yeah, it's been a while. I'm really craving to go. I want to go to the Newport Jazz Festival. Oh, yeah. There's so many great jazz festivals. I, I am not to your level and to where I probably 
<laughs> we'll get in, but I would love to at least, uh, at least attend, you know, but, um, what about you? What festivals have you been to recently? Um, I, well, I haven't like, let's see the one I was in a, like a long time ago when I was in high school was the Detroit jazz fest, part of the Wayne state, all state, all-star youth ensemble. Um, so Chris Collins led that. And I was, um, very young at the time, um, applied this year, um, applied to, you know, Ann Arbor summer fest and some various festivals oh. locally. But, um, I wanted to go to, I think there was a festival that had to get rescheduled because of COVID. Um, it was local. I think it was like the DMA Detroit music awards. I don't know if that's a festival, but it's like a ceremony probably with live music, I think too. Um, but yeah, I don't, I haven't been to festivals really in a long time or a really good concert. You know, I've missed um, going to like Hill Auditorium in Ann Arbor. Last I saw, I think, was it Herbie or Diana, Diana Crawl? And this was a while back and actually got the privilege of meeting her briefly. Um, and, you know, since then, I don't think I've gone to much, but um, I hear you in that. I think there's going to be quite the, the, back not backlash kind of like a resurgence when everyone gets out again it's going to be like oh my gosh the roaring days of like music it's yeah just hope that I just hope that a lot of the venues survive and um yes. I know a lot of them are get, taking a big hit with this and uh, might not be able to you know stay afloat but I really hope that the, a lot of them are able to it's so important and um the scene and community needs it so much so I know that there are some grants and stuff out there for um, nonprofit, you know, venues like organizations that to try and help them stay afloat. I think it's also a hard time because venues and musicians don't know when this is going to be over. True. So yeah, it's really hard for musicians that normally book things and plan many, many months in advance, like six months in advance, they book gigs and tours and stuff. Um, that none of the venues know when they're going to be open again. None of the venues know if they're going to be open again. So everything is really, truly on hold. There's no, oh yeah, let's push it out. I had a tour, a few tours um, in March and April that got canceled and they're trying to reschedule them for, for next year. And they originally were saying in the fall, but now it's looking like maybe the fall won't be the end of it. So now they're talking about 2021, but they're also not sure. So it's just a very strange time to be a musician because much of what we do, um, we can't do. Actually, yeah, almost all of what we do, except and for create. We can't our- even pl- we can't even do that because I mean, uh, for for those who are watching, we were supposed to go live at eight o'clock, and and Facebook and Zoom integration let us down. <laughs> and now there's no good way to just you know like us to jam together. We tried, but there's too much d- delay, and it's just yeah, even yeah. it's hard to even be remote in doing this. So it's yeah. like you're in your own little silo. <laughs> mm-hmm. Whoever creates the um playing together is going to be very wealthy. Very wealthy, indeed. Yes. So it's like, well, why can't we do it? Let's just get some coders, right? <laughs> Let's do it. Oh, I'm sure people are working on it rigorously. They're probably already doing it's very it. Very important. It is. So what about, um, you know what I've noticed a trend? Some, a lot of um, female jazz artists uh, that I look up to, like Candace Springs, um, Lila Bialy, who's a Juno award-winning Canadian pianist. Um, they, I see they, they're releasing a lot of new music which I think is great. And I'm seeing some artists do that and some artists um, kind of hold back. I just wonder what your thoughts are on maybe releasing music now. Is there something to be said? Like Nora Jones just came out with something. Is there something yeah. to be said keeping, you know, the momentum going, try to increase record sales or should we all be waiting? I don't know. I guess they're both sides to it. I could see the benefit of releasing music now. A lot of people have time. People are listening to a lot of music. Um, I think oftentimes that releasing music also accompanies shows. Like a lot of times people come out with records to support a tour or um, it used to be, it's not as much anymore, but selling merch, like selling CDs and selling, um, you know, t-shirts or, or whatever it is, posters. And those would accompany a tour. And it was like this whole package of, um, new music and also opportunities to kind of push your career and you can't book a tour with it. So it's kind of a weird time. Like I was supposed to record another album in June. It just recently got pushed back, um, to later because it's probably not going to be safe to record in June, and also we can't rehearse. 
um, and we were planning to be rehearsing for many months before. But I think it would also be difficult to release it because I want to use it as a vehicle for bigger things, like um, like booking a tour. And it's I feel like it's hard to say. I mean, I'm sure people understand in the time of coronavirus that you know you couldn't book a tour when it came out. But if you say, oh, this album came out a year ago, it's already kind of old, but you haven't really done anything with it, yeah. you know? So it's kind of, to me, and it costs so much money to record an album that to me, it's such a big investment that I really want to get the most out of it. I want to make sure that it's, it, I can, I did everything that I could to, you know, show people this music and, and, you know, all of this stuff. So for me, I think I would want it to accompany like a tour and some other stuff. But I think that if you already had music done and ready to go out now, I also understand um, if you had already started promotion on it and you had hired a publicist and it was already in the works, um, release it. I mean, I think it's great. Yeah. No, I'm just kind of looking around seeing like, you know, I'm in a similar boat to you. I'm holding on to all my music and I'm like, well, should I wait or should I go ahead? Some people are going ahead with it. So yeah, yeah I hear you. I think there's both sides definitely to the coin. And um, speaking of, of albums and new, new work. So your last album, Padme, correct, came out, what year did that come out? 2015. 2015. So now in 2020, you have, technically you have 2021, you'll have another album. So yeah. are you, um, what, what was kind of the, what's going to be the theme? Are you allowed to say kind of the theme and thinking behind this? Yeah, album? yeah sure. sure. Um, it's a, another album full of original compositions, new or, you know, new original compositions. And the theme is just kind of my journey in the past five years. Uh, a lot has happened since I recorded that album and I've had a lot of projects in between. Um, we were talking a little bit about um, two years ago, I had a project of the music of Lil Hart and Armstrong, um, this great jazz pianist and vocalist and composer, and I uh, arranged 10 of her compositions, and I'm hoping to record that. I really want to record that music, um, and this project is one of my original projects, and I'm so excited because um, Posi Tone Record Label, which is based out of LA, is um, is recording this album, and I'm really excited to work with them. I did a few collective albums with them with other musicians and we all brought um, some of our compositions to the recording session. I did two albums with them um, last year and I'm just, I love working with them and I think this is going to be a really, really cool project and I'm excited to play with my band that I've been playing with for so many years. We're really tight with this music and I think it's, yeah, it's just going to be really good. Cool. Is your husband going to be the drummer? Um, yeah. Yeah. He is going to play drums. Good. Good. So, um, what was I going to say? Oh, do you, do you think you're going to do a, what I just saw Candace Springs do for one of her, uh, for the, the women who raised me, she just came out with an album about like, um, Ella Fitzgerald and Chardé and a lot of the women that influenced her music when she was growing up. She did like a mini docu. It was really cool. I don't know if you've seen it. It's like 13 no. minutes and it's just like a very mini documentary. And it would be super cool if you did one on Little Heart and you're on, on your story and like what the album meant to you and you know who your inspiration was and just I see yeah. that now and I'm thinking hmm maybe maybe we should do that. I don't know. It's another yeah, I'm, tool, you know. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm I've been working, I've been applying for some grants to get funding because I, I want to, um, my hope is to have Terry Lynn Carrington, amazing drummer and producer, produce the album. That's my hope. Um, and yeah, I'm, I've been applying for uh, many grants trying to just get funding for all of this stuff. So um, hopefully. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed for you. In the near future. Yes. That's great. Awesome. Well, um, Oh yeah, I wanted to ask you, I saw on your website too, you were involved with Webop back in the day, I don't know, in, in working with um, educating young kids about jazz. Does that still going on or, or no? Yeah, um, that's a program through Jazz Lincoln Center um, to teach kids eight months to five years old um, about jazz music and they're really fun classes. Um, I'm a piano accompanist, so I'm, there's also a teacher and vocalist, um, and I would, I work with those, uh, 
the teacher and the pianists play every class. Um, it's been really fun. It's not happening right now because of coronavirus and um, they're not doing it online because it's really about interactive. Um, some of the kids are crawling and not speaking and stuff. So it's, it would really be more about um, having that sense that whole full sensory experience but it will resume when this is all over and i've also been doing another program through jazz lincoln center and teaching um, middle school and high school kids about jazz music through this program called jazz for young people and it's a program where um it was um, Sandra Day O'Connor and Wynton Marsalis put together this program um, as a way to incorporate U.S. history and jazz history. Um, they saw that there was a lot of similarities between um, events in U.S. history, like the Civil Rights Movement and, um, and music that was being created at the time, like John Coltrane wrote compositions um, that were inspired by a uh, church bombing by the KKK during the Civil Rights Movement or, you know, Nina Simone, a lot of her lyrics were inspired by, um, by things that she was protesting in the street of injustice and all this stuff. So um, they created a curriculum to go into public and private schools um, in New York City, and they also have it in different uh, states. They have it in LA, and or they only have it in LA, so specific cities, um, and to teach kids about jazz music. And basically they have a band leader, and I'm leading a band this year, um, and then the band, leader has their band so i've been going with a quartet and um yeah it's been so much fun we've had such a blast there's three different curriculums and um jazz and democracy jazz and the great migration and then this last one was supposed to be jazz and civil rights but it's been kind of put on hold because um we were in the middle of it when all the corona stuff happened so we did one show and we were supposed to have many more but they all got canceled I bet so. they were disappointed. <laughs> yeah, but that's been really fun. And it's so inspiring to me, too, because, well, one, to share the history of jazz music, I think, is um, just really powerful to empower kids to use their voice and um, and also stand up for injustice in the world, which is still happening all the time. So we can kind of show them these amazing role models, many who are um, women and many who are African American. And it's this really powerful, beautiful message of um, people, you know, fighting for what's right and through art. So I really enjoyed doing those as well. Yeah. yeah. Very needed. You're doing some very admirable things. <laughs> Thank you. How, how about you? Are you teaching out there? Yeah, so I, uh, I'm new to teaching. Uh, I, I, I said I, from a young age, I'm like, I could never be a teacher. I'm not patient. And here I am teaching and I'm loving it. So what does that tell you? <laughs> yeah, that's great. But I have a very, very darling young girl who reminds me a lot of me when I was little. And I, I was telling you earlier, I'm corrupting her by teaching her jazz by ear the way I learned when I was young. And, and, you know, I'm still trying to make sure she sight reads and has her books, but she's wanting to learn like jazz cat and she's going through all the Faber books and she's like, I have them all memorized and she's playing them and she's like kicking butt. She's like seven. I'm that's like, awesome. Go, Maddie. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. So I, yeah, so I'm teaching, enjoying that. I'm still getting used to this whole remote, you know, world we're in. I think everyone is, but, um, yeah. You know, taking some time to hone some of my tunes. I'm working on um, one song, The Windmills of Your Mind by Michelle Legrand, and I'm um, going to hopefully record it with um, Marion Hayden, wonderful Detroit um, bass legacy drummer, amazing. And then um, Karen Tomales, or bassist, I'm sorry. And then Karen Tomales on drums, who's an amazing um, Detroit based drummer. And kind of hoping to do a fresh rendition of that, you know, a little different than Sting and Barbara's. Um, not one that's done too often, and it's very challenging for me to sing, so I'm right now in the thick of voice lessons. <laughs> and um, Even my voice teacher says it's hard, so it must be hard. <laughs> mm -hmm. But yeah. Uh, yeah, just working on that. And waiting, waiting, just waiting in the wings for, hey, when, when is the album going to be done? I'm, it's always weird because I'm at like song number eight and I'm like, that's such an odd spot. It's like, if you're going to do, do like four songs or do like 12, 10 or more, like everyone I see releases longer EPs. So I'm no, not. No, eight is good. 
Okay. Um, my album, I had nine. And okay. Yeah. How many are going to be on your 2021 one? I think 10. Okay. Yeah. That's a good number. It's a sweet spot. It's a sweet number for, um, for this, but we'll probably record a couple extra, like 13. Yeah. yeah. And then we'll cut out, see what makes the cut. Yeah. And maybe a couple singles. Maybe I've never done a single, um, but I'm very open to that. And I, like I said, I'm trying to figure out this whole electronic world yeah. and um, get more into that. It's very different than piano. A lot of, um, you know, your ears, you have to really grow your ears to be able to hear and learn how to adjust all the sounds and stuff for synthesizer yeah. and organ and all that. So I would love after this next album to do a project, to have an electronic project. So Ooh, that, seems, that seems fun to do single. Can you teach me how to, everything you've learned? <laughs> oh man, I've been learning. I've taken some lessons and I'm also just watching on YouTube um, yeah. videos on how to do it. It's, it's really interesting. It's, it's a totally different part of your brain than, um, than playing song right. because a lot of it has to do with learning how to manipulate the sound and, and, and actually one of the main exercises is to listen to something and then try to recreate it. Oh, and wow. it's the hardest thing in the world. <laughs> So I'm, I'm enjoying it a lot. I really love electronic. I've always loved like Herbie is one of my absolute favorite, you know, pianists of all time. And he, his electronic stuff is some of my favorite music ever. And he's such a um, innovator in like future things. He's always at the forefront of technology and um, what's new. And he's such an inspiration to me because even at his age, he just turned 80 a few days ago and he's still like the most modern yeah. person and thinker. You know, sometimes you hear when people get older, they're stuck in their ways and they don't want to embrace the new technology. And he's like, let me learn it all. I want to, you know, I want to get this. So I want to be like that. Yeah, you will be. You will be. Yeah, I hope so. Maybe you'll get to, have you gotten to work with him yet? Um, I have met him several times through Danilo. Yeah, so I'm really grateful for that. Um, I saw him and and was hanging with him a little bit with Danilo um, two years ago. Wayne Shorter and Herbie Hancock played at um, the NJ Pack in Newark, New Jersey, and that was unbelievable. It was so interesting. They just uh, Herbie was playing with all these sounds he had just made on his computer and Wayne was listening to the sounds and then just creating things that complemented it. And it was all completely in the moment and it was just really inspiring. So after that, Danila was there and, um, and I went backstage and, and we were all hanging and yeah, he's such a nice guy, Herbie. I would, I would love to study with him at some point, but I know he's very busy. I'm sure you will. Yeah. Well, do you want to go ahead and play something for us? Sure. Yes. Yeah. What uh, are you going to play? I think I'm going to play a new composition that I, I'm hoping to record on my next album. And this is called Reach Within. And it's, it's the name is just inspired by a postcard that I saw. Um, and it said... Uh, reach within on it and I and it was this beautiful picture of a flower and um, it was just making me think about kind of cerebral like this state of um, state of music that is just very like atmospheric and vibey and um, I'm trying to get more into that uh, just creating a picture and a soundscape Yes. So this is Reach Within. Thank you. 
can resolve. <laughs> can resolve for you. <laughs> oh my god. No, it's beautiful. Oh my goodness, that's gorgeous. I love when you go to it with the octaves. It's really, it really brightens up the song. Oh my gosh, I love it. So pretty, so lifting, very energetic. It was a lot of movement and fluidity in it. I love that. Thank you. So, Are you gonna? Can you play something for us? Yeah, yeah. Hopefully, it sounds okay on your end. It sounded great. You're playing. I mean, no delay. So, I was just gonna play a, a Burt Bacharach tune. Um, what the world needs now, just my own version. <laughs> Figured be useful. <laughs> a great uplifting happy song and I love your rendition it was all the chords and I like how it was kind of rubato yeah, yeah that that's my hallmark I love making things rubato and I love harmony I, if I had to pick between harmony and melody I have to say I love harmony more I don't know how yeah. you know, as a pianist you probably agree yeah <laughs> and, a, and a horn player would say melody so it's just completely different. yeah right I know you can you can just totally reinterpret anything it's yeah one yeah. of the benefits of playing a chordal instrument. Very true. Yeah. And on our last note, I'm wondering if you could literally on our last note, can you um, play your favorite chord? I just, I'm always curious. I ask other pianists, Ooh. like if you have a favorite chord on the piano, <laughs> what would it be? I've been really into sus with a third. Ooh. Yeah. The third has to be on top, but um, like, So, yeah, you 
you have to put the sus4 on the bottom and then third is on the top. Oh, it's bothering me. <laughs> the flat seven. I'm trying to go with my transposition skills. Yeah. That's pretty. I like it because typically if you put the third on the bottom, it wouldn't sound very good. Oh, yeah, too heavy. But if you put it on the top, it sounds really light. Nice. How about you? Oh, I'm, the, I'm a minor 11 girl. Minor 11. Minor, like, E minor 11 is my favorite chord in the world. Maybe 13. I love crunch. Yeah. Love it. Minor chords, yeah. Minor chords in sequence, when you just do minor, 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 it great. sounds great. Yeah. yeah. Well, this has been a lot of fun. I can't say I've done something this unique, this cool before. I, you know, I'm just doing it Hannah's Corner for as long as COVID is going on. I am committed to this and I want to share with other great artists like yourself and who are, you know, keeping a great attitude and continuing to write and finding a way to let their light shine. So... Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to catch up and see you again. It's been a while. And yeah, yeah this right. is so inspiring that you're doing this during Corona, COVID-19. Yeah, it's great. Well, thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm really lucky to have you have you on the show. And um, let's let's stay in touch. And, you know, hopefully we get to play together in person at some point. Yes. Down the road. yes. Tell me if you come to New York. I will. I'm already looking forward to being back. I was there a couple of Januarys ago for a weekend um, visiting oh. Sarah McKenzie, um, jazz pianist. Oh. She's Australian. But uh, would, I went to jazz at Lincoln Center, met Winton very briefly. And, oh. you know, I know you're, you know, that's kind of your home base. So just with Lincoln Center and everything you've done. But um, now that you're in New York, yeah, I would love to. Yeah, we, let me know. We'll, we can play four hands at my, my house. <laughs> okay. Sounds good. Um, All right. Well, I'll go ahead and post this. Feel free to share it. And then, um, apologies to anyone on your end who was wondering why we were AWOL at eight o'clock. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Thank Have a great night. You Thanks, too. Bye. Bye.